so yeah, today we're going to be talking about brain anatomy. Uh, and uh, I think this is a fairly important topic, which is why we're uh, spending a whole lecture today on this. Um, some of this is going to take time to learn, uh, getting used to neuroanatomy, where things are inside the brain, as well as what they do and how they relate to each other, is something that does take time. Uh, and uh, we'll do a little practice, hopefully, today. Uh, and over the course of the term, as we talk about uh, different functions of the brain, we'll be reviewing the structure in greater detail uh, in conjunction with the function. And I think that that's really cr crucial to learning this, because otherwise it's just memorizing a lot of uh, geography or cartography. Uh, if you understand what these structures do and how they work together, that will make it a lot easier to uh, conceptually keep them straight. Uh, so, I want to review some basic terms uh, that the textbook talks about in detail. Uh, there are three standard axes for uh, mapping or navigating inside the central nervous system. Uh, the anterior-posterior distinction, the rostral and caudal distinction, and the dorsal and ventral distinction. Uh, there are some other spatial relations that people will use uh, that are important to know. So I'll show you a picture of these in a moment, but lateral and medial are an important concept. And so medial means closer to the midline of the brain, and lateral means farther away from the midline of the brain. Uh, so for instance, you may hear uh, people talk about um, uh, a medial um, uh, brain tumor, uh, medial, and sometimes also mesial, which means something slightly different but similar. Uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, for instance, refers to a, a epilepsy pathology that's in the medial part of the temporal lobe, as opposed to like a lateral temporal pathology that can also be seen in some less common epilepsies. Uh, the superior and inferior distinction is also used, uh, and that's a, an up-down distinction. The most common example is a superior and inferior curriculi that the book mentions, uh, but there are a few other uh, examples of that as well. Uh, and then ipsilateral and contralateral, meaning uh, on the same side or opposite side of the brain or of the body. And so those are really important in terms of thinking about motor functions, for instance, which are generally contralateral. And so again, uh, the left hemisphere generally controls uh, motor and sensory experiences for the right body and vice versa. Um, we also talk about a tract being ipsilateral or contralateral. So you talk about motor functions, for instance, um, and some sensory functions. Some functions are uh, ipsilateral in certain parts of the nervous system and contralateral in other parts of the nervous system. Uh, so for instance, the motor tracts all cross the midline um, at the, uh, the brainstem, and, uh, and so they become ipsilateral and further down versus in the brain, they're contralateral. Um, inside the central nervous system, inside the brain, it's also important to keep track of the fact that the cerebellum is, is opposite to the rest of the brain. The cerebellum is, uh, is organized contralaterally. Uh, and that's uh, because essentially there's a double crossing. Uh, fibers cross over from the contralateral side to the ipsilateral side and then back to the contralateral side. Um, I said it backwards, I'm sorry. So the, the fibers in the body are ipsilateral, like your nerves, uh, for your motor nerves, are coming out of the same side of the body that the, the muscles are on. They go up the um, spinal cord ipsilaterally, they cross contralaterally, and then they recross before entering the cerebellum. Uh, so these concepts are important to keep track of also, uh, although these are the kind of standard uh, dimensions or directions inside the brain. As the book talks about, it's probably easier to imagine this if you think about a four-legged animal, like uh, you know, this alligator or crocodile uh, in the picture, uh, because the neuraxis is straight in this organism, <coughs> and so you see that the, the dorsal and ventral definition is consistent, whereas in the brain, um, of human, uh, there's a 90 degree bend. And so and when you're talking about the cortical structures, dorsal is on the top and ventral is on the bottom. When you're talking about the spinal cord, for instance, dorsal is on the back and ventral is on the front. Um, here again is a picture of lateral and medial, uh, and those are shown uh, in the right handed picture. Um, and then the caudal to the cephalocaudal or anterior to posterior dimension is shown here. So the rostral or um, cephalic or anterior dimension, this is forward in the brain, caudal is towards the tail. Uh, and so that term caudal is kind of similar to caudate nucleus, which is a tail-shaped nucleus. Um, so these are important dimensions. Um, sometimes when you hear about neurodevelopment or um, body development, 
You hear the concept of development is cephalocaudal, meaning that the development occurs from the head to the tail. Uh, and so that's where the, that term comes from. Here's a different view of the neuraxis and development. Here um, you see the brain uh, developing over time um, from the initial neural tube uh, into the more complex structure. Uh, and so as the tube develops here in two dimensions and here in three dimensions, you see that the, the different structures are developing the forebrain as well as the more uh, primitive structures. Uh, and here is what they look like stretched out essentially in space. And then um, ultimately the brain uh, takes the shape uh, as it develops. So again, the rostral and caudal dimensions apply here. Uh, if I show you this briefly in the uh, fully developed brain, rostral to caudal, and that line kind of follows this. And so when you're in the brainstem, you're thinking about caudal this way and rostral this way. When you're in the cerebrum, you're thinking about rostral and caudal. Uh, because again, uh, that elbow bend happens, and the thalamus and structures below it are essentially in the, in the bent part uh, that's uh, parallel to the spinal cord, and then the rest of the structures are more uh, angled forward or horizontally. Uh, the book talks about neurodevelopment, uh, and mostly we'll be talking about gross anatomy today, but in terms of the fine structure of the brain, uh, the cerebral cortex is a six-layer cortex, and generally it is important uh, to note that the um, uh, foundational cells, the, the um, uh, stem cells, are near the ventricles, in the ventricular zone. The glia expand out, uh, and then they form the uh, pathway by which the neurons migrate out. Uh, the neurons migrate out uh, uh, to, the, to the earlier layers, and then the subsequent neurons pass them to the upper layers. Um, and over time as well, the horizontal cells and so forth. Um, really briefly, in terms of some disorders, some ways that this can go wrong, uh, spina bifida is a common one to be aware of. Spina bifida essentially means that there is a failure of closure of the spinal column uh, that can affect the spinal cord. The most uh, innocuous form of spina bifida is called spina bifida occulta. And the occulta means that it's not known. Uh, you can actually go through much of your life not knowing you have this condition. Uh, if it's there, uh, usually the physical manifestation is a small, uh, unusual patch of skin that's hairy on the back uh, in the place where the um, spine is breached. But this can be relatively asymptomatic. Uh, you might find this out in the course of a back injury. Like if you did back in imaging because you hurt your back, they might find out about this and it may become a risk factor that you think about in terms of future exertion. Uh, but it's not uncommon to find out about this in your 20s, or and for some people, probably never find out about it. The rest of uh, forms of uh, spina bifida are more serious. Uh, and so here, the difference is that the spine, the, the, um, the, the, uh, that not just the spinal column bones, but also uh, the spine itself is malformed. And so here you see the yellow is the spinal cord, and then this is the CSF space. And you're looking at the spinal cord being inside with some displacement of CSF fluid and or um, the spine itself being displaced out of the spinal column. Uh, with these more significant cases, you will have symptoms. Uh, typically what's common for spina bifida is um, uh, young children are often able to do at least some limited walking. Uh, they may need a support like braces, but many of them are able to walk. Uh, oftentimes, walking declines over the course of adolescence, and so many individuals with spina bifida as kids will use a mixture of walking and wheelchairs. A lot of them do end up more wheelchair bound in later life. Uh, there can also be other consequences. Typically, this is going to be above, um, this is going to occur above uh, a level that would cause urinary incontinence, and so uh, typically, uh, Adolescents will need to learn to catheterize <coughs> to manage uh, bowel continent, to manage bladder continence. Uh, and then as the case gets more severe, the symptoms get more severe. Uh, but typically it's in the lower back and primarily this affects the, the lower body. Um, some individuals with spina bifida, more of them than, than in other populations, also have hydrocephalus and they're at an increased risk of having other neural developmental or cranial developmental kinds of issues and so they can have uh, cranial abnormalities 
uh, that are comorbid with the spina bifida. Um, and even a fair number of the ones who don't have an overt abnormality of the brain can have some subtle deficits, like problems with visual spatial thinking. Uh, they do more frequently have hydrocephalus, and so a lot of them do need shunting for the hydrocephalus. Uh, and there can be other things as well. Uh, but a lot of them are very functional. Some of them are perfectly within normal limits cognitively. They can learn to drive, work, live independently, and so forth. Uh, when I started working with kids, I volunteer at one of Paul Newman's camps. I still try to go down there when I can. And the second group of kids that I hung out with were um, spent kids. And so I got to know them uh, really well over time. Uh, the most common cause of spina bifida that's identified as a risk factor is uh, folic acid deficiency in the mother. And so um, people do talk a lot about the need for folic acid supplements, especially uh, for women who are trying to get pregnant or, or who are not taking birth control or otherwise preventing uh, conception. Uh, that doesn't necessarily explain all cases. There are people who take folic acid and have kids with spina bifida, but it is one of the bigger known risk factors. And so typically, uh, you see there's a cyst in the back here with the opening. Typically, these kids get neurosurgery uh, right uh, at birth uh, to, take, to correct this, to fuse the spine, to close off uh, the um, CSF pouch, uh, and hopefully to prevent any further compromise to the spine. As I mentioned, um, the core cerebral cortex is primarily a six-layer cortex. That six-layer cortex is also called the neocortex, if you hear that term. And the neocortex means this is a relatively young structure in the evolutionary development of the brain, uh, as opposed to the archaea or paleocortex, which has less than six layers. You hear some different terms thrown around. Um, limbic structures are, are important areas that have uh, archaeocortex. Uh, they have three-layered cortex, in particular, uh, like parts of the hippocampus. Um, Sometimes those parts of the brain are called the reptilian brain uh, because this cortical, these cortical structures are evident at that level. And some of these structures are called the mammalian brain because uh, they arise uh, in warm-blooded um, uh, animals. Uh, but so many of our structures, many of our most important cognitive structures, the ones that are most different between us and other animals, are neocortical. But as I'll show you today and throughout the term, the pain, the, um, Three-layer cortex and some of these other non-neocortical areas are actually very important in terms of understanding human behavior. So here's a picture of the six-layer cortex. Uh, you see the six layers. Um, and each layer has a different structural organization and different kinds of nerves. Uh, and so you hear, see here that um, layers five and six, uh, which are on the inside, uh, have uh, descending nerve fibers that uh, transmit to the other parts of uh, the body, uh, whereas the upper layers tend to do more uh, uh, intercortical connections. Uh, and there are also neurons like this one shown in layer four that um, just locally connect. Uh, up here there are a number of fibers called U-fibers that um, come in like this and go back to another relatively adjacent cortical structure. Uh, and if we talk about epilepsy in more detail, there's a, a procedure called multiple subfield transection uh, for certain kinds of epilepsies that essentially involves uh, uh, neurosurgically sniffing some of these U-fibers to contain localization and abnormal electrical activity. Uh, those are in the upper layers, again, which is why a procedure like that is more possible. Um, and so these layers can uh, connect locally. There's some layers that connect more globally. And then these cells in the lower layers, these pyramidal cells, communicate out of, uh, out of the cortex. <coughs> uh, in the cerebral cortex, as shown in the picture, the white matter is interior, and the, uh, the gray matter is exterior. The, cere the cerebellum has the opposite organization. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, here's a picture, a uh, scanning electron microscope picture of six-layer cortex. So you can see that uh, with enough magnification, you can sort of see these layers. Uh, they're much easier to see with certain kinds of staining techniques. Uh, and again, um, there are layers uh, relatively close to the exterior surface that are more for local connectivity, and then uh, the pyramidal layers, um, uh, in particular layer five, that has neurons projecting down. Uh, here's, in contrast, a picture of three-layer cortex. We'll get to that in a second, actually. Sorry, uh, we're a little later. Uh, I have a handout there, we'll get to it in a, a little bit later in the class. Use some practice identifying structures. Um, here's three-layer cortex. This is uh, 
the Dante Gyrus of the Hippocampus, uh, which is a uh, real standard, good to know, three layer structure. And you see, uh, the structure there, you see under the high magnification and SEM pictures, uh, you can see that structure really clearly. Uh, and so, this, if you do a, a slice of the brain and you look at cortical, neocortical, and, and paleo or archicortical structures, like if you do a slice section through the temporal lobe, you'll see structures that have three layers like this, and you'll see structures that have six layers, uh, like in the lateral temporal lobe. Um, we talked about the neuraxis and the different ways of um, navigating inside the brain. Related to this, it's very important to be familiar with um, different kinds of sections of the brain. Uh, the brain is a three-dimensional structure. Obviously, it's hard to visualize in three dimensions, plus things like these videos and the book are two-dimensional uh, naturally. And so sections are really important, and they're a really important way of understanding the brain. They're also kind of the standard imaging tool that we use clinically. So clinically, when we do a CT uh, or MRI, we'll be looking at cross-sections of the brain. Uh, there are three kinds of cross-sections that are commonly used, a horizontal um, or coronal. Uh, there's a coronal section, which is like this. Uh, there's a sagittal section, which is like this. And there's a transverse section. Um, so here are pictures of those. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's an error here. Um, so the error is that frontal and coronal line up and horizontal and transverse line up. Sorry about that. Um, and so here, uh, again, uh, you see a transverse or coronal slice, the sagittal slice that's, the, um, that's cutting through the brain this way, and then the um, top-down slice, uh, or transverse. Uh, I'm sorry, or, or, or horizontally. Yeah. Um, these are our artist drawings. Here's a uh, stain brain structure. Uh, so here's a coronal slice. Um, here you see the globus pallidus and the uh, uh, and cutting nucleus. Uh, so you see this is a um, slice through the uh, basal ganglia. You also see the amygdala down here. Um, and uh, you're looking at the brain again in this plane uh, and relatively anterior. Um, this is a transverse slice stained. Um, here you see the brain from the top down, essentially, or the bottom up. You can see a little bit of the cerebellum. Uh, you can see, I think these are probably the mammillary bodies, the thalamus. Um, and uh, that's what, so that's what a square section looks like uh, in that plane. And then in the sagittal plane, this is close to the midline of the brain. Uh, you can see the corpus callosum. You can see the cingulate gyrus. Um, None of this says so much. Uh, and the subcortical structures again. Here you see a fairly good uh, visualization of the cerebellum. Um, so we, what I'd like to do is practice these some more uh, a little bit later today, uh, getting to know these slices, starting to get to know where structures are, at least the most common structures uh, that the book talks about. I'm trying to give you some cues for keeping track of where they are within the brain. Uh, here's a picture of the cranial vault. And so this is looking at the brain from, this is looking from the, the skull from the top down, uh, if the skull were essentially cut open in the middle. Uh, and the reason that I wanted to show you this is because so this is where the brain sits with cerebral spinal fluid is cushioning. There's some structures that are important here in terms of understanding uh, brain and acquired injuries. Uh, in particular, uh, the sphenoid bone here, uh, this ridge. Uh, and so um, the frontal cortex sits up here, and the temporal cortex essentially sits here. You can kind of see that if you, this picture you have to turn, but if you imagine that being overlaid on top of this, the frontal cortex, the occipital cortex, the temporal cortex, and the parietal cortex above, above here. But these bones here sit near the front edge of the temporal cortex. And so during a head injury, for instance, these bones can pose a physical barrier for part of the brain, and that can be a source of damage. It's also really common during a head injury for uh, the um, olfactory and optic nerve, the olfactory nerves, which are at the bottom of the brain, to be pressed up against the skull uh, up here. Uh, and that can cause a loss of smell, uh, either temporarily or permanently after a brain injury. It's a really common symptom that we don't always ask about clinically. Um, but it is uh, potentially an important one 
And one thing in particular to be aware of with the loss of sense of smell uh, in brain injuries or for any other reason <coughs> is that when it comes to tasting food, uh, you have several taste senses in your tongue, like sweet, sour, uh, sweet, salty, uh, bitter, and so forth. But much of the uh, sophistication of your taste comes from your smell. Um, for instance, you don't have receptors on your tongue that tells you that orange tastes orangey. That's a combination of things like the sweetness and the um, sensitivity to that that the tongue provides with the smell sensation of the orange. And so uh, if you lose your sense of smell, your, your sense of taste is actually significantly impacted. Uh, lots of people who have this in symptoms, especially after a brain injury, We'll talk about needing to engage in mechanical eating because food doesn't taste good to them anymore. And that's, again, because of the loss of sense of smell. Um, in this picture, you also see uh, some foramen that we'll talk about later, uh, some entry points for the jugular vein and uh, nearby for the internal carotid artery. Uh, and um, so those are on the bottom of the head coming up. And the foramen magnum is, is the interface point between the uh, spinal column and uh, the brainstem. Craniosynostosis is another disorder I'll mention really briefly at this point. It's a disorder that involves abnormal development of the brain, of the skull, uh, that can affect the brain. Uh, and in particular, what happens is the skull has a number of sutures uh, that uh, fuse over the course of childhood. Uh, in the case of craniosynostosis, one or more fused sutures uh, seals prematurely. And uh, there's some common symptoms that a pediatrician might notice, like a lack of the fontanel, um, which is the soft spot in the head, or a raised hard ridge at the suture site. Um, sometimes these are also recognized by unusual head shape or uh, asymmetry and abnormal head size development. Uh, and so these are the things that you'd look for clinically to tell you about this. Craniosynostosis can be fairly benign, but um, more serious cases can cause uh, compromise to brain development. Uh, and in that case, surgery is indicated. For the more mild cases, there may be surgeries that are done uh, to correct some associated problems like difficulty coordinating the eyes um, because of a lack of symmetry between eye placement um, or something else like that. Uh, otherwise, you know, sometimes too, you think about the cosmetic component to it. Uh, we are trained to judge faces in part by their symmetry. Uh, and so an asymmetric face can be perceived as uh, unflattering and that can be significant in terms of a child's social development, but primarily we do the surgery is indicated when uh, there's compromise to the brain. Here's a picture uh, I get from my grad from my grad school. Uh, she has where I trained uh, before and after pictures of a child with a frontal um, with a right coronal craniosynostosis. Uh, so here you see the asymmetry around the eyes. Uh, you see the correction of that. It actually looks pretty good. Um, there's some satellite symmetry in the bottom picture as well. Uh, if you look at this eye and here uh, compared to this eye. But it's actually a significant improvement. You can see that the eyelids are opening more symmetrically after surgery. Uh, so there could be some fairly significant improvement. You also see, if you look here, it's a little hard to see, but the conjunction of the eyes isn't great. Um, they're both pointed out a little bit more than they ought to be. And here you see that looks more normal. Uh, and that's going to help with his vision. Um, in terms, of in terms of talking about the supportive structures, we also talk about the meninges. Um, the meninges are a tough connective tissue that has several functions, including protecting and shielding the brain, and also coordinating CSF reuptake. Uh, and there are three meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, and the, pi the pia mater. And I thought that was actually really interesting in the book. He talks about uh, where these names come from, uh, that in Arabic, uh, this mater is a translation of an Arabic word that has to do with swaddling, essentially. And so these were thought of uh, by Arabic physicians as uh, swaddling materials for the brain. Um, the term also was used for mother uh, in Arabic because there wasn't a unique word for that. And so when it was translated into uh, European languages, uh, it got translated that way. Uh, and that's where this term comes from. I actually did not know that. Uh, but what I would like you to know about the, the three membranes uh, the dura mater is, an exterior, is the most exterior membrane, does not conform to the shape of the brain. And so you see, you see a sample of the dura mater, it's, it's conformed to the shape of the skull in essence. Uh, it's thick, inflexible, and protective. Um, it's fairly tough. Uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, even uh, post-mortem, it's hard to, to work with uh, a strong <coughs> membrane. The arachnoid membrane has a dense network of small blood vessels, uh, which have a really important function in terms of reabsorbing CSF. 
Uh, and then the pia mater is uh, the internal membrane that does conform to the surface of the brain. It's actually relatively flimsy, especially compared to the dura mater. Um, so here are some pictures of that. Uh, you can see how these play out both in the brain and in the spinal cord. Uh, and so uh, the concept is similar. The pia mater uh, attaches to the brain surface with its convolutions. It also attaches to the spinal cord, whereas the dura mater in both cases is, um, is uh, not uh, conformal to the, the neuro, uh, uh, nervous system structures. Uh, and so um, here again, here's a picture of that uh, subarachnoid space in the arachnoid membrane uh, and the blood vessels there uh, that are being used uh, for uh, reabsorbing the CSF. And so in terms of this uh, cerebrospinal fluid introduction, um, CSF is produced by choroid plexus, which is located in the ventricles. Uh, and it's originally vascular, vascularized, so they can pull fluids from the blood, continuously create CSF, uh, I think something like the order of 120 milliliters uh, for three hours or something like that. Uh, and so it's creating this fluid and pumping it out from inside the ventricles continuously. Uh, it flows from the inside out, and so it's produced in the in ventricles inside the brain, the lateral and third and fourth ventricles, and it follows this path outward uh, from the lateral, ventri lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe uh, into the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle uh, and then through the foramen at the bottom of the fourth ventricle and into the subarachnoid space. Uh, there it's reabsorbed by arachnoid granulations that transferred into the sinus system for drainage. Um, and so here's a picture of the choroid plexus. You can see it. Um, this is a false color picture. Uh, from there, so usually that right. But you see here it's a structure that's inside the ventricles. And it's not just inside the lateral ventricles, it's inside the other ventricles as well. Although there's a lot of it in the lateral ventricles. When you think about that flow, all the stuff that starts in the lateral ventricles is progressing through all the other ventricles as it wends its way towards the subarachnoid space. Uh, so it starts here, but there's uh, more added to it uh, further down the road. And and here's a graphic of the ventricles themselves. Uh, and so, again, there are two ventricles uh, that are lateral uh, that, that uh, extend into the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, the lateral ventricles have a frontal horn uh, that uh, sits near the amygdala and hippocampus. They have an occipital horn uh, that extends back into the occipital lobe. You can see that here also. Um, and the foramen of Monroe uh, connects each lateral ventricle back into the third ventricle uh, that's here. Um, the third ventricle sits near the thalamus and the hypothalamus. There is a little punctuation in the third ventricle called the massa intermedia. Uh, what this is essentially is that the two thalamus, thalami, uh, intersect and connect physically here. Uh, and in most individuals, there's a, a little hole where uh, where the fibers are actually physically touching between the, the thalamus on the left and the right. Uh, some individuals don't have that. Uh, its primary purpose is not uh, coordination of information across <coughs> the hemispheres. Uh, so it's not a pathological finding if this is missing, uh, but it is a good landmark. Uh, and so the thalamus is here, and hypothalamus is down there. And it's a good landmark for orienting to all of that. Um, the, then the cerebral aqueduct, which extends down into the fourth ventricle, which is near the brainstem uh, in terms of orientation and cerebellum. Uh, and the fourth ventricle then has uh, three foramen uh, uh, that uh, allow for drainage. Uh, and so here you see that from the sagittal view. Here you see that from, looks like from a coronal viewpoint. Um, let me show you some other pictures of what some of this stuff looks like. Here are the arachnoid granulations. Uh, if you actually see them on the postmortem brain, uh, this is uh, with the dura mater removed, so that you would see these. And this is this kind of shiny surface here is the uh, conformal pia mater. Uh, so there's the brain tissue actually goes in a little further here, for instance, in this ridge. The pia mater kind of conforms to it, and the arachnoid granulations 
uh, when you post mortems, oftentimes when you remove the dura mater, some of the arachnoid granulations will stick to the pia mater, so you can visualize them like this. Um, and this, I think, is a picture uh, that looks at the intracerebral uh, uh, commissure, uh, and sorry, the intracerebral um, uh, uh, left. And uh, so this is the, uh, a structure that uh, goes in between the two cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres. It's part of the dura mater actually here. So the dura mater over the top of the brain, it comes in like this, and the structure is called the faults. Uh, and so you can actually see a little bit of that there. Um, in terms of the, actually you can see it on this picture, um, the dura mater, it's a little hard to see in these pictures, but um, so the dura mater is on the outside here. Uh, the faults, it does go into this fissure, and so that's kind of uh, an exception to the rule that it doesn't follow the surface of the brain. The dura mater also has one more flap here that um, interposes itself between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum, uh, and that's called uh, the tentorium. And uh, so that's where that um, separates those two bolts. Uh, and you'll hear that term sometimes uh, in the context of describing things as supratentorial or infratentorial. And infratentorial is something that happens below the tentorium. Supratentorial is something that happens above the tentorium. Uh, an example of that would be that uh, brain tumors in children are usually infratentorial. They usually affect the cerebellum or brain stem. Uh, brain tumors in adults are usually supratentorial, meaning they affect the cerebral hemispheres. So does the dermata go around the cerebellum as um, well, or does it end yeah. above it? Ah, I see what you're saying. So there is, yeah, so that there's a flap here, and then this lower surface is also covered. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And the brain stem and the spinal cord are all covered as well. Um, so, so that flap is basically just an extra division uh, here. Uh, here's a picture that looks more at the sinuses. Uh, and so, again, CSF starts internally in the lateral ventricles and winds its way down. Um, then it goes in back into the uh, arachnoid, uh, subarachnoid space. It gets reabsorbed and sent into the sinus system. Uh, the superior sagittal sinus, for instance, runs along uh, the box um, and uh, then ultimately drains back into the venous system, like here. Uh, with the uh, uh, jugular vein. Uh, so this is how uh, those fluids ultimately make their way back to the heart to be recirculated. Hydrocephalus is, a, is an important concept in the context of um, uh, CSF. So it's a, essentially water head. Uh, this is a situation where there's excessive cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and a couple things are important to think about with this. Um, fluids are very difficult to compress. They take an extreme amount of force. They're essentially incompressible. Uh, brain, st brain structures are also not very compressible. It's not very good inside the brain to have structures that can't be compressed and add material. And so excessive CSF will lead to some compression or displacement of brain structures. And this is a really uh, hard thing for the brain structures to tolerate. Um, so because CSF is constantly being produced, if it doesn't get drained, uh, which is called a communicating hydrocephalus, where it's flowing all through the ventricles, but then it's not getting out. Uh, or an obstructed hydrocephalus, like a brain tumor, uh, impinges on something like, like say you had a brain tumor somewhere in here and it impinged on the cerebral aqueduct. That would be an obstructing hydrocephalus. Then fluid is being built up here. It's moving through the lateral ventricles and down, but then it gets caught here. And so these lateral ventricles have to expand in order to accommodate that fluid and the brain gets compromised up here. Um, so that's an obstructive hydrocephalus. And either way, it can lead to an excess accumulation, which can be problematic. Uh, I'll mention one special case of hydrocephalus, which is called normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is a condition that occurs in older adulthood, typically. Uh, it's a neurological condition. Uh, it's a kind of communicating hydrocephalus. And for unclear reasons, there's too much CSF. And it's of interest in particular because it's a potentially semi-reversible cause of dementia. Uh, if you can relieve the CSF pressure, you can actually improve some of the symptoms and prevent uh, progression of the disease. Uh, it has a classic 
um, neurological picture, and the way to remember that is, is this um, is this wet, wildly and wacky, and so um, sometimes weird instead of wacky. Uh, wet meaning uh, individuals with normal pressure hydrocephalus have urinary incontinence, wobbly meaning they have gait changes, and wacky meaning they have cognitive um, psychiatric symptoms. And so if you see this constellation, uh, especially if these things happen in close time to each other with an older adult, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus is an important rule out um, versus Alzheimer's or another progressive dementia. Um, and it's important, again, because you can treat it. Uh, the definitive thing to do, if you think this is the case, is a lumbar puncture. Uh, brain imaging can be helpful. It doesn't really conclusively say whether it's NPH, although a good uh, neurologist will know often from the brain imaging. Uh, and the brain imaging is relatively low risk. LP is a little higher risk, uh, so you can insert a needle uh, into the cerebrospinal fluid uh, in the lumbar spine and draw out some fluid. And normally you would be doing this as a diagnostic to see what's in the fluid, like blood products don't belong in the CSF as we talked about last week. So you can find those there that are either abnormal. Um, there's other stuff you can find in the CSF, like um, debris uh, from uh, white matter disease, like in multiple sclerosis. In this case, what you're doing is a little different. What you're doing here is relieving pressure temporarily because you're removing CSF from the system. Um, so with that temporary pressure relief, the CSF pressure goes down. If the symptoms improve as a result of the pressure release, that argues strongly in favor of NPH, uh, and then you can think about a neurosurgical intervention uh, to permanently manage the CSF. How is the pressure measured? Um, like, you mean like in milligrams of mercury, or? Just the pressure on the brain, because my niece actually had this problem, and they said the pressure is supposed to be about 20, hers mm -hmm. is 143. Okay. She actually is now legally blind because wow. of it. She yeah. She lost her sight, and they, she was in the hospital for a really long time, and they ended up having to put a shunt in, mm -hmm. and it dumps the excess fluid in her stomach. Yes. How did they measure the pressure? Uh, so, um, a real common way, uh, clinically, not invasively, to know that there may be a problem with this is, uh, is to look at is a fundoscopic examination to look at the eyes. Uh, and so uh, the interior of the eye is communicating with the CSF space. And um, what you'll see on a, a, a retinoscopic examination is that you'll see a, a bulge of the disc where the optic nerve connects with the interior of the eye. Uh, and so that um, uh, abnormal disc can indicate uh, called papal edema. It indicates that there's a CSF uh, pressure problem. But then, once you know or you strongly suspect there's a problem, uh, you can monitor it invasively. Like you can, uh, you can bore a hole in the skull and put a bolt, an ICP bolt, intracranial pressure gauge. Uh, that would be done really commonly in brain injury, uh, like with severe TBI. Uh, it's really common to do that intervention. It's not low risk, of course. So you need to have a good reason for doing it. Um, which, if, you, if the pressure is very high, if their clinical signs are high, pressure is high, then they make a lot of sense. Uh, I think that when you do a, when you do get to the point of shunting, you can also insert hardware to do uh, pressure monitoring. But for instance, in brain injuries, uh, the pressure will tra transiently can sometimes be very high, and so uh, neuro neurosurgically they'll put a bolt in to monitor it temporarily, and then they can remove that later. But you are talking about developing a hole in your skull, and so again, you don't want to do that unless you have to. But so it's, it's typically measured, uh, you know, like other pressures and, and millimeters of mercury or tor or something like that. Uh, and there are standards for what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, so 20 is kind of a typical normal score, but those very, very high pressures can be very dangerous and can cause neurological damage. And it can be permanent, actually, even in the case of something like NPH. Um, not all of these symptoms will necessarily get better. Uh, it's more common that these two get better. It's more common that the cognitive decline only partially reverses. But again, it may get worse over time, and if it were Alzheimer's or something like that, it would get worse over time. So even stopping it in its tracks can be very helpful uh, in terms of quality of life for the person. So a really good question. It actually also kind of relates to this next topic, uh, hematoma. So uh, NPH, or hydrocephalus in general, is when there's too much fluid pressure in the form of CSF in the brain. Another condition that can cause pressure effects inside the brain or space effects inside the brain are hematomas. And here we're talking about too much blood where it doesn't belong. Uh, there's a few kinds that I'll mention at least briefly. 
An epidural hematoma uh, means that it's outside the dura mater. Uh, and if you remember the dura mater I just mentioned doesn't conform to the brain's shape. And so you would expect that the epidural hematoma would also not conform to the brain's shape. And so it actually has this convex lens shape or lentiform shape uh, because it's outside of the dura mater. Uh, the subdural hematoma, in contrast, is uh, underneath and so it can conform to the surface of the brain. Uh, and then finally, there's an intracranial hematoma. This is when uh, the blood hemorrhage is actually inside, co-located with the brain tissue. A parenchyma is just another word for brain tissue. Um, so here's the picture of some of those graphically. And the subdural hematoma, again, has this lens shape. Uh, and it's outside the dura, so it doesn't follow the surface of the brain. And then, sorry, epidural hematoma. It's outside the surface of the brain. It doesn't follow uh, the contours. Here you see that. So here you see that there's a, uh, a mater here. Here you see that there's direct contact essentially between the brain folds and the hematoma and the subdural. And the intracranial hemorrhage is, is inside actual brain tissue. There are a few other variants. You can have a hemorrhage inside the ventricles. Um, you can, so you have a few other things like that. Uh, there are also diffuse hemorrhages, um, like petechial hemorrhages, and so it's possible to have you know, little spots here and there rather than a large bleed. Um, so hematomas are really important in brain injuries, uh, in head injuries. Um, and in particular, some of these can grow very quickly, uh, and so they can uh, cause uh, very significant symptoms or uh, deterioration of the brain. Um, they can also, uh, what's, what's important to know about hematomas and TBI is that some of them will happen with delayed effect. The slow bleeding ones can actually be very dangerous as well. The fast bleeding ones are dangerous because they quickly cause significant impairment of brain tissue. The slow bleeding ones are dangerous because it may be too small to see with the initial imaging. Like if you have a head injury and you get bust right to the hospital and they do a CT, you may not see that small bleed. Uh, but it's slowly accumulating blood inside the head over time. And so then you may actually go home and then start having symptoms while you're asleep or the next morning or something like that. And then it can become a medical emergency at a later time. The intracranial hemorrhages can sometimes do that, but you'll typically see those early on. Um, and, and typically when there's this, it's, it is a sign of severity for brain injuries. So here are some brain imaging pictures of this. So here is a, an image of an epidural hematoma. Again, epidural meaning it's outside the dura, has this lens shape, doesn't conform to the brain surface. Um, there's a couple of things to know about in this image that I'll mention at least briefly. Um, the, this middle uh, between the two hemispheres is called the midline in imaging. Um, and here you see this is where that midline is. And you can tell from this brain that the midline is not where it started out, right? It's moved over. You can see the ventricles are deformed in their shape. Uh, that midline shift is another severity indicator in tra traumatic brain injury. Um, midline shift is, is, is pretty serious, typically. Uh, and you want to watch this kind of thing very closely, maybe uh, surgically uh, apt to remove part of the skull to allow for some decompression, evacuate this hematoma uh, so that this midline shift doesn't continue. This is a real bad prognosticator in terms of uh, outcomes uh, for brain injury. Here's a picture of a subdural hematoma in the chronic phase. Here you see it does follow the contours of the brain. You see there's significant impact on the brain. See how big this is. The midline is shifted a little bit here. So probably not as severely as in this case, but it is shifted. And you see a lot of compromise on the, uh, this is a, a brain image, and so this is the right hemisphere and that's the left. They're flipped in radiography um, like this, right and left. And so these are both right hemispheric injuries. Here you see the real compression in the right hemisphere. Here you see compression of both hemispheres. This hemisphere is being pushed over. And it's affecting the left hemisphere as well. And then here's a picture of an inter intracranial hematoma uh, in this region uh, here. Um, again, in the right hemisphere. Uh, and um, so this, this has a relatively more focused um, It's really going to depend on a number of things. Um, so it's probably not that one of the hematomas is more serious than another. Um, 
with the epidural hematoma in particular, the fast pace of it is often a big problem. So it can really quickly lead to symptoms. It really, really is crucial that there's quick intervention. Um, with the intracranial hematomas, it's typically, I think, less that it's severe in and of itself, but usually that's an indicator of a really high force level to the brain. Uh, and so it's, it's an indicator of a significant brain injury. Uh, and it's one issue, but, um, but there usually are several other things going on in that brain. That's a really good question. Uh, the other thing to know about these is it's also going to depend on where they affect the brain. There are parts of the brain where the symptoms are going to be more prominent than others. As we talk about brain localization, uh, you know, for instance, um, having any of these in the, the language centers of the brain is going to impact language significantly. With these right hemisphere lesions, uh, there can be a lot of neglect, which can be a real issue uh, post brain injury or stroke. Uh, and so, for instance, people with uh, right hemisphere lesions often um, since they neglect left space. We'll talk, we talked a little bit about that already. Uh, that will make it really unsafe for them to drive. Uh, can make them unsafe to even navigate on foot. Uh, they can engage in a lot of other safety behavior issues. Um, so, yeah, so they're all pretty serious. Um, depending on how much blood there is, how quickly it's growing, how available interventions are, uh, and what other complications you may prevent uh, interventions. What I'd like to do is a few more slides and then maybe we'll take a break and do an activity also. Um, okay. So I'd like to talk about a few things I think that are less covered in the book uh, that I think are interesting and important. Um, one is the idea of cerebral dominance. Um, and so as you probably are already aware, uh, the brain it is largely symmetric when you look at its structure, but there are some important asymmetries. Um, and the two most important asymmetries in the brain are that typically there's a hand preference, uh, and that extends to other kinds of body use. Like most right-handed people will also kick right. Uh, and so handedness is one very important lateralized effect in the brain. And then the other one is um, uh, language dominance. And most people have language in their left hemisphere. So left-handedness, first of all, is cross-cultural. Uh, when you think about biological findings, if something occurs across times and across cultures, there's a pretty strong indication that there's likely some kind of biological basis for it. And in fact, it's fairly likely that there's going to be some kind of functional advantage to the existence of that trait. Uh, as far as left-handedness is concerned, it does occur across cultures. It does occur in men more than women. Um, and it occurs in somewhere between 5 and 30% of the population, which is kind of interesting. So some studies have suggested that there is cultural variation in how many left-handed people you have. Um, and that's potentially interesting, because if we understand more about what it means to be left-handed, there may be factors um, uh, in the environment, uh, either in the cultural environment or in the physical environment that dictate uh, this and that epigenetically drive uh, having more or less left-handers. It's likely a long-term finding, and the book talks about, maybe talks about this. Uh, you can look archeologically uh, for evidence of left-handed people having existed, and there's evidence dating back more than a million years uh, for left-handedness. And so it's a long-standing finding, which fits with something strongly genetic. If these things don't come and go quickly. Uh, there can be epigenetic changes over time, but something like this, if it's coded in the genes, those things change over a very, very long time scale, like hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Um, so there appears to be a significant genetic contribution, but there's also some kind, probably also an environmental or epigenetic contribution. Um, something you may not know about handedness, it probably occurs on a continuum. Um, most people are most right, mostly right-handed, although there's variation among right-handed people. Some people are more right-handed than others. There's some people who really can't do anything with their left hand who are right-handed. And there's some people who can get by with their left hand okay. Um, most people, though, are mostly right-handed. They do most things with their right hand. Uh, and if you do a lateral dominance examination, so you can obviously see how people write. But you can also ask them things like, how do you throw a ball? They might do this, or they might do this, right? Um, you might ask them how they kick. Uh, and so they'll kick with their right or their left leg. Uh, other things you can do, um, how they use a telescope is a good one. So they're going to look with their right eye or their left eye, because again, that's a, a sign of, of um, uh, body, body uh, lateral dominance. Uh, 
you can ask how they uh, hold a rifle, uh, which I'm going to show you a shoulder, as well as the hands. And you can see which hand is, is in the traditional right-handed position, which hands in the traditional left-handed position, uh, or left-handed would, would shoot like this. And it's these, this shoulder, typically, uh, and so forth. Uh, you, there's lots of other ones. From bow and arrow would be a good one. Uh, and so you can see there's a bit of variation. What you'll find with a lot of left-handed people is they will do some things with their right hand, uh, or right foot, or right eye. Um, although some people are extremely left-handed and they do everything uh, left. Um, and uh, as you probably have read about this, you know, again, it's pretty biological. There have been cultures, including our own, where people were uh, trying to force left-handed or forced to be right-handed. You can do it. It generally doesn't work very well. Those people will have poor coordination and they'll generally struggle against it. It's something that emerges pretty early. Uh, typically during the toddler years, you start to see that preference. Uh, in some situations like autism, where there's a deficit in functional development, you may not see the hand dominance emerge as quickly. Um, but generally speaking, you know, this is something that is genetically there and it emerges over toddlerhood. There are some um, things other than handedness that seem to be associated with left handedness. Um, left handers tend to have slightly later sexual maturation, and it's not just cognitive sexual maturation. But it's also these other physiological characteristics, like secondary sex characteristics. And so that would argue for something different, either with hormonal receptors or hormones or um, some other part of the reproductive system. Uh, they typically have a shorter height. Uh, they typically have a larger corpus callosum. And in general, people with a larger corpus callosum have a slightly smaller brain, and they tend to have less compartmentalized brain functions. Um, and that finding has been replicated in a wide variety of contexts. Um, women tend to have larger corpus callosi than men, and they tend to have slightly smaller brains than men. They tend to have less compartmentalized brain functions than men. So that's one example where you see this pattern. Uh, another example where you see this pattern is um, gay men tend to have a larger corpus callosum and a, a, a smaller brain and less compartmentalized functions uh, than heterosexual men. Uh, and you see that same pattern of left-handedness. Uh, what is the general trigger behind all of that is unclear. Um, it doesn't have a huge impact. You know, the, the compartmentalization between men and women or between any of these two groups is actually very similar. It's more similar than it is different. But there can be some times where this becomes more evident. Um, generally speaking, uh, at least in some cases, less compartmentalized brains and left-handers tend to be a little bit better at, um, at um, holistic creative thought and a little bit worse at more systemic um, sequential thoughts. Um, if you do have a stroke, you know, which of course you don't want to have, uh, you may find a difference in terms of uh, impact post-stroke. If you have less compartmentalization, you may have more diffuse impacts that are less focused in one area. You may be more able to use other cortical structures to compensate. But so there are some differences. They're potentially interesting in terms of the way uh, all of these different things develop. There may be some relationships between them. There's a lot we don't understand about them. And it's important to remember, too, that these kinds of findings, they tend to correlate uh, with these differences, like left-handedness versus right-handedness. But you can't really tell who's who just by looking at the size of their corpus callosum. Um, and you know, you'll find people with relatively smaller corpus callosums who think coordinating their left and right hemispheric functions very well. Uh, and there's actually, um, you can have a developmental agenesis of the corpus callosum where you're missing part of it. And that can be sufficiently innocuous that you don't even know you have it. Uh, and I don't know if it's an urban legend, but what is always said is that every once in a while you'll find someone like a medical student who uh, volunteers to be the one who goes in the brain imager. And it turns out that they have agenesis of the corpus callosum or dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. And it's obviously so clinically subtle that it hasn't affected them to the point that they got into medical school. So it's pretty subtle. It's not going to cause gross impacts. Um, and that's different from an acquired insult. Like we talked about alexia without agraphia, uh, which is an insult to the corpus callosum. You can be missing that part of the corpus callosum developmentally and have essentially no symptoms from it, which is different than if you lose it after your brain is developed. Uh, going back to cerebral dominance, a few things to know about cerebral dominance. Uh, most right-handed individuals, probably about 90% of right-handers, uh, and about 50% of left-handers have this pattern, where language is fairly strongly localized to the left hemisphere, including verbal memory, and typically also sequential and logical tasks. 
And then the right hemisphere is more specialized in visual and spatial functions, including visual memory. Um, so this is 90% of right-handers, 50% of left-handers. The remaining 10% of right-handers and 50% of left-handers or so um, have varying degrees of, of other like, of lateralizations. It is not typically true that this other 10% and 50%, they don't typically have language strongly on the right hemisphere and visual spatial functions strongly in the left hemisphere. Usually they have bilateral representation of both skills, um, but some of them can have kind of the exact opposite of this pattern. And people for a long time have talked about the possibility of a two gene kind of model. There aren't two specific alleles that have been recognized here, but the idea is that essentially these two genes code for the typical lateralization model, the right-handedness and the left language dominance. And in the absence of the genes, it's essentially a toss-up which you get. And what that means is that some right-handers actually don't have the genes that code for right-handedness or left language dominance, but because of the toss-up, they still end up in this category. They're more likely to have offspring, for instance, who would be left-handed or atypically laterally dominant for language. Um, and then, so then, so that's, so essentially that's a quarter of people who lack the, the genes. And then the other three quarters of them, a quarter of them will be right-handed without standard lateralization. The other half, some of them will be left-handed without standard lateralization, and some of them will be left-handed with a standard language lateralization. So anyways, um, the point is that hand dominance and language lateralization vary. Um, but it is also important to understand that the brain is essentially always wired, so the right hemisphere handles the left body and vice versa. Uh, and so um, there are potentially some interesting consequences of that. For instance, a lot of left-handers, um, so a lot of left-handers who have right hemispheres um, handle uh, the left hand and are dominant motorically, but whose left hemispheres still handle language, oftentimes they'll have really poor hand writing. Uh, because both hemispheres have to be involved and there's less specialization. Whereas in the typical pattern, most many of us are right-handed and left hemisphere language, so the hand and the language are all the same time the brain tend to have slightly better handwriting. So it potentially has some inter interesting kinds of consequences of this. There's a test that's primarily used in epilepsy uh, that tells us a lot of what we know about lateralization of the brain. It's called the WADA test. Uh, it's not an acronym, it's named after a person. Um, so the WADA test uh, and variants um, that have to do with what medication is injected or where uh, involve medic injection of a strong sedative. Uh, phenobarbital is a common example, or amobarbital. Uh, and sedative is injected in such a way that it's delivered to one cerebral hemisphere at a time. Um, it's typically injected in the femoral artery, I believe. Um, so. Uh, what it does is actually put half the brain to sleep. So this is potentially really interesting uh, if you're, you're geeked out about brain functioning, because you've got a person whose half of their brain is asleep and the other half is awake. And you can use behavioral tests to see what the awake half of the brain can do. Um, for instance, can it speak? Can it understand language? Uh, and can it remember? Uh, can it remember words? Can it remember pictures? Or both. And this tells you whether that brain, that half of the brain essentially is necessary and or sufficient for the skill. So for instance, you might find that a person is strongly left language dominant. What that would mean is if you put the left hemisphere to sleep, the person is going to have profound aphasia. They're not going to be able to talk to you or understand you um, or remember verbal information. Uh, and if you put the right hemisphere to sleep, what you'll find is that these skills, the language, the speaking and understanding language and the remembering words are essentially unimpacted. That means with half their brain asleep, they can do this just as well as they could with their whole brain awake. Uh, and so in that case, you would suggest that language is strongly lateralized to the left hemisphere. You can find out, for instance, that language is strongly lateralized to the left hemisphere, but verbal memory is not, uh, meaning that the right uh, hippocampus, for instance, is also involved in verbal memory. This is really important in epilepsy because if you're going to do a neurosurgical intervention, you want to know what the epilepsy focus tissue does. Um, for instance, if that tissue is also functioning to allow you to speak, you're going to think about that very carefully, because if you remove it, then the person's going to lose their ability to speak. Um, and in contrast, in the ideal situation, that tissue does nothing, uh, except produce seizures, uh, because of the pathology 
and because the brain is reorganized and compensated and moved all of these structures somewhere else, typically to the other hemisphere. And in that case, you can cut the tissue out, and the person will have essentially no functional deficits associated with the loss of tissue. Uh, there are some more techniques as far as epilepsy is concerned to do more fine grain mapping. Uh, so intracranial EEG, rather than putting the electrodes on the surface of the scalp, you can actually put them on the direct on the surface of the brain and get really fine grain mapping. This would be uh, important, for instance, if you had a seizure focus and you found out that it was near your language centers, you might ask, well, how close is it? How much overlap is there between the seizure tissue and the language tissue? Uh, can I do a neurosurgical intervention that is fine grain enough that I can cut that piece out without affecting language? Uh, so here's a graphic of the WADA test. And so here, doing the injection, the fluid comes up the common carotid artery uh, into the left hemisphere, puts it to sleep. Uh, the right hemisphere is awake. The right hemisphere can see and recognize the object, but it can't name it, because in this case, the left hemisphere handled language. Uh, but if you show a picture of the object and ask the person to point to the object with the hand that's controlled by the right hemisphere, they don't have any trouble following that task, because that task doesn't involve being able to name the object. It just involves being able to identify the object visually. They can do that, but they can't tell you what state it is. Uh, and so this is a person uh, in this picture with a left hemisphere language lateralization and a right hemisphere visual spatial capability. Here's a picture of the distribution of left and right handedness. Uh, and this tells that story again that it's not, it's a, it's not a binary distribution. There's a range. Uh, and so here on the right hand side are the right handers. And you see that there are lots of people who are very strongly right-handed. But there's a fairly large number of people who are somewhat right-handed. And then over here, you see the left-handers. And so that, again, there are some people who are very, very strongly left-handed. There are many people who are weakly left-handed. While we're on the topic of um, lateralization, I want to mention very briefly that generally speaking, uh, left-handedness or sinistrality uh, is not a disease. There's with people being left-handed, uh, contrary to beliefs in society over time. Uh, generally speaking, it's a normal variant. There most likely are some competing advantages uh, to left-handedness, meaning it's the kind of thing that, as long as there's a certain stable percentage of the population, uh, the people who are left-handed are able to pass their genes on uh, successfully, which causes the, the condition to continue. There is an exception just called pathological sinistrality or pathological left-handedness. And this means that the left-handedness occurs to a developmental or acquired uh, injury. Um, and here, uh, the right hand controls the left hemisphere. And I mean, the right hand is coordinated with the left hemisphere, and the, left hemis the right hemisphere is coordinated with the left hand. The left hemisphere gets damaged. The left hemisphere controls the right hand. It no longer becomes a good option for your primary motor control. And so it shifts over to the left. But this person has a left hemisphere that was designed for a right-handed person that they're now using as a primary. Uh, and so that's called pathological sinistrality. It's associated with a brain lesion, developmental brain lesion. Um, in principle, although going to be less common because left-handedness is less common, there could be pathological dextrality, I guess, meaning you're supposed to be left-handed, but you have a, a right hemisphere lesion that causes your handedness to shift to your right hand and your left hemisphere. So in principle, it's not, it's an equal opportunity offender, but the percentages are going to be affected by the fact that, first of all, these lesions are rare, and then second of all, attendance is also relatively rare. Uh, while people are coming back, let me address a couple of things quickly. Uh, someone asked a very good question about the names of these sections, and I apologize. It turned out to be, the answer turned out to be slightly complicated. Um, pretty much everyone, We'll know what you mean if you call this a horizontal plane, and we'll know what you mean if you call this a transverse plane, and everybody calls this one a sagittal plane. Where the confusion comes in is the use of the term transverse. What the book does is, if you think back to this neuraxis picture, what they're defining transverse as is, is a cross section across the neuraxis. So like this here, and like this here. Um, and so consistent with that, where did that slide go? Um, consistent with that, 
they're calling this a transverse plane and also calling this a transverse plane. If you look at the literature, lots of other people call the horizontal plane a transverse plane, which is what my slide said. Uh, so I apologize. This is an example where I'm, my point is not to be mean. If you use that term transverse, there may be some confusion about what you're talking about. I would recommend using these terms, like the brain atlas does, uh, which is coronal for that section from the front going back, horizontal for that section from the top down, and sagittal for that section from the side. Uh, I'd recommend those three terms, just to be consistent. But I'm not going to try to trick you with these on a quiz or exam, particularly for the different uses of the term transverse. Just because if you look at the literature, it is fairly common to call this a horizontal, this horizontal plane a transverse plane. Although, the book is being consistent also, and I understand why the book says that this is not a transverse plane and why this is a transverse plane. So, I wanted to clarify about that. My apologies. Stick with these terms. And more particularly, keep track of where things are. Like, if you're looking at one of these sections, know that you're looking at a section from the front back, or from the top down, or from the side. Um, think about things like, uh, if you know that, um, you know, for instance, that this is a sagittal section. Where's the back of the head and where's the front of the head? You, know, you should you should know the cerebellum, for instance, is in the back of the head and not put it somewhere next to the eyeballs. Um, you should know, for instance, that the uh, cerebellum is also towards the bottom of the brain, not at the top. So the spatial relationships are probably more important than the specific terms for the slices. Uh, that was one thing. I did have a chance, I, I'd be happy to look this up in more detail, but someone also asked a question about uh, uh, intracranial hematomas and their relative severity. Um, I did look up something really quickly on that, and, and one pattern that may be of interest is that when it comes to brain injuries, uh, subdural and subarachnoid hematomas, the ones that occur underneath the dura, um, underneath the dura mater, those hematomas are associated with a much higher mortality risk than uh, epidural hematomas. Um, so here's a paper, for instance, uh, uh, that's relatively recent from this year, uh, talking about this. And, and for instance, here they talk about a particular mortality rate associated with older adults with subarachnoid hematomas and subdural hematomas. Um, for comparison, the, the, I don't know about an elderly, but the epidural hematoma rates, I've seen some studies that estimate more than 10%, uh, whereas this is you know, 50% here. Uh, you don't want, I mean, obviously, any mortality is bad. 10% is a really high mortality risk. But there's a big difference between 10 and 50. Just to go back to that question. Um, then finally, someone had asked about the quiz. Uh, what you can expect for next week's quiz is it'll be relatively brief. It'll probably take 10, 15 minutes to finish. There'll be some things where I will ask you to name at least some structures that I consider more obvious. They're probably pretty likely to be ones that we've practiced today. Um, just to get into the habit of that, I'll probably ask you to be able to identify where the front of the brain is or the back of the brain in different kinds of pictures. Uh, and then some of them will be fill in the blank or possibly multiple choice, those kinds of questions that get in some of the other content from today's lecture. But it's going to focus on today's lecture and the associated reading materials, uh, the neuroanatomy stuff. That's only going to be prominent there. And again, the logic of that is not so much uh, to be mean, but I do think it's important to learn this stuff. It's going to be one of those things where uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, going to uh, school to study um, psychology, but uh, you don't know, you know the basics that underlie that psychology. In order to have a sophisticated discussion about these different functions of the brain, we're going to need to have some basics down, and, and these basics uh, in terms of neuroanatomy are really important. So I want you to practice up front. Uh, it's going to be an investment that pays off not just in terms of the quiz next week, but in terms of the rest of the course. Any other questions about the quiz? Yes. Um, are the pictures going to be in color in black and white? Because in black and white, it's a lot more difficult to distinguish between blogs. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't have access to a color printer. Um, what I will probably have to do is make sure that I give you slides that you can, you can do. I don't think I'm going to ask you next week to handle an MRI, because that is harder, at least in terms of locating specific brain structures. I might ask you, you know, where the occipital lobe is in an MRI. I think that's fair. But asking you where the cutamen is is going to be a lot harder. Um, I will try to get you, I will walk through it myself and make sure that it's doable uh, and try to be fair. Um, 
if the structures are really hard to read on print, maybe what I can do is show you something that you can use on screen and you can use that in conjunction with the print. I'd be happy to do that. It's a little clearer. Yes? So should we focus more on the lectures than the book? Um, as far as the quiz is concerned, you know, the lecture is probably pretty complete. Um, for the exams, the, the book's fair game. You should be reading it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good question. Anything else? Um, let's continue. Uh, so, um, we're here. So, earlier we showed a picture of the brain being divided into forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain sections. And again, these are the relatively older developmental parts of the brain. And this is the mammalian, human part of the brain. You see that even with um, even within the talon, there are some older structures and a very new structure. Um, but then these are old structures that you tend to see in more organisms. Uh, further down the food chain, essentially. Uh, the forebrain structures are aligned around the ventricular structures. You know, we talked about how the different parts of the physical construction of the brain are important in their own ways. And so these develop in parallel. It's not a coincidence where the ventricles are, because um, again, the stem cells, the progenitors, are near the ventricles. And so the lateral and third ventricles are organizing principles of the forebrain. The aqueduct is an organizing principle of the midbrain, for instance, the periaqueductal brain matter, and the fourth ventricle is an organizing principle of the hindbrain. Uh, so here's a picture of the neocortex, uh, and we're going to obviously spend quite a bit of our focus on neocortical structures. Um, here's that view again where the singular incidentally is between the corpus callosum and the cortex. Um, here you see, again, in a horizontal slice, the frontal lobes. This is from underneath uh, with the cerebellum removed. Uh, so you see the temporal lobe and you don't see the parietal lobe. You see the occipital lobe. Uh, if you looked at this from the top down, you'd see the parietal lobe on the top. Um, that's here uh, in the sagittal view. Uh, so again, it's on the top, and so you're not seeing it from the bottom up. Instead, you're seeing these structures. Um, and uh, so parietal lobe, frontal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and then here's a, a lateral sagittal view, the exterior view. Again, temporal, parietal, frontal, occipital. And again, in terms of the high level functions, the frontal lobe handles motor behaviors in a broad kind of sense. The parietal lobe handles sensations, somatic sensations, in a broad kind of sense. The occipital lobe vision and the temporal lobe uh, audition and language. So, um, there are, and, and we'll talk also about association areas, which are really important, that is these areas can work together, and a lot of the cortex is actually used to work in multiple modes, like association cortex that combines visual information with spatial information, or association cortex that combines visual information with semantic information. Um, so those areas are really important in understanding how the brain works. So let's talk about the lobes briefly, the cortical tissue. The frontal lobe, again, broadly responsible for motor functions. When I say broadly responsible for motor functions, obviously there's the primary motor cortex, and so this is the strip of tissue um, near the central sulcus uh, here, uh, the precentral tissue. This is a, um, is a, a homunculus or a body organized map of motor functions, like your arm and your hand. So these neurons are responsible for volitional movement of all these different structures in your body. Um, but motor functioning also in terms of speech, Broca's areas in the frontal lobe, uh, motor planning in a broad kind of sense, like thinking before you act, but also planning to act out in multiple steps. <coughs> To sort of think about the way you play chess, uh, hopefully. Uh, motor planning is really important. You're doing multiple steps in advance. Or a much simpler task, you think about the way you uh, fold an envelope and put it in, in, in an envelope. Fold a, new, a letter, put it in an envelope, and seal the envelope. It's a real common coordinated movement task. It requires significant motor planning. Uh, directing attention, or sort of the motoric aspect of attention. So telling you what to pay attention to. Um, and then coordinated problem solving. And problem solving, in a sense, is a high-level motor task, because ultimately, all the thinking you do is only as good as whatever you do behaviorally 
as long as the thinking stays inside your head, it can't really achieve any functional goal. The thinking has to result in engaging or not engaging in behaviors that cause some kind of outcome for you. And so this, again, is part of the broader motor functions that the frontal lobe is responsible for. Um, here's the central sulcus. Uh, how far back it's going to be uh, it will depend on the tilt of the brain in this picture. But the, the central sulcus is an important organizing principle. It separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. It separates the motor cortex from the sensory cortex. So the primary, the motor cortex, uh, the motor homunculus is right here. The sensory homunculus that handles the, the somatic senses for the body, like your sense of touch, uh, is here. And generally speaking, the two are closely organized. And so for instance, um, your, your sense for your arm is close to your motor functions for your arm. And that's, that's sensible because your, motor, your sensation from your arm is going to be closely involved uh, in the motor response. If you think about, for instance, when your uh, leg goes numb because you've been sitting uh, in the same way for a long time and you get up, that's a good example of how hard it is to walk without the body senses, right? Without knowing what your, body, your leg is telling you. And that's part of that is this isn't what's going numb, but that's a, that kind of coordination between the sense and the motor functions are part of the reason why this co-location exists. So motor, sensory. Um, consistent with this also in, in a broader kind of sense, really the frontal lobe is a motor cortex. The temporal, parietal, and, and uh, occipital lobes are primarily sensory, sensory cortices. Um, the temporal lobe then, the primary sensory modality is audition. In a broad sense, language then is an is a audition function. It's a, it's a hearing function, receptive language in particular. If you think about language, our, our language structures are really organized around talking and being understood. Because if you think about evolutionarily, um, written language is something that stretches back, you know, probably on the order of eight, ten thousand years or something like that. But spoken language is something that stretches back far, far longer than that. And so our structures are organized around spoken language. Your receptive language structures are co-located with your hearing structures. Your productive language structures for speech are, are the most prominent area. of your, your speech courtesy is essentially where your, your productive language still are. Um, and that's true in a broad kind of sense. And again, when you look at language-based dis disorders of communication, like for instance, in autism, you don't just have a deficit in motor production of speech, it's a language deficit. Kids with autism are generally also poor at learning signing. They're poor at learning gestural communication. They're poor, pure, poor at learning language or communication in a broader sense. And in a broader sense, sign language is a communication tool, a language tool. Um, some, a piece of interesting, uh, maybe a little trivial, maybe not. Um, I mentioned that the left hemisphere is um, uh, more of a specialized hemisphere for sequential tasks and language tasks. Logic kind of falls into the language domain. And so to some extent, um, you see this in music. Uh, people who are untrained in music, uh, who listen to music, tend to have broader diffuser activation in response to listening to music. It's more in the right hemisphere. They're understanding the music holistically. <coughs> Some of that will transfer to the left hemisphere, to language-related areas in the left temporal lobe for classically trained individuals. Um, because they see language, music as a language, essentially. They're interpreting it. If you think about, if you play a musical instrument, you can read music. We're talking already about a language function for music. And you're already activating those same traces when you're thinking about music that you're hearing. You're processing it as the series of sounds and the, the notation and the composition that's associated with that. And this may be a broad principle. Like You may see some of this in other kinds of arts, too. Like, if somebody who doesn't really understand painting goes to see paintings at the Louvre, they're going to have a different interpretation than someone who's classically trained in oil painting. It's going to have. And so you may see some hemispheric differences between the two individuals. Uh, and some of that stuff ends up in the left temporal lobe. Um, similarly, some higher order mathematical skills are really language and logic-based skills, and logic is essentially a language kind of activity. You may see more of that in the temporal lobe versus more basic more basic mathematic arithmetic skills or more spatial skills. And that may have a more of a right hemisphere preference. Um, deep temporal structures, which are also part of the limbic lobe, are very important in learning and memory also, so you should know that. Um, 
verbal memory in the left hemisphere, but also um, spatial memory in the right hemisphere, typically. Um, here's an external picture of the brain. This is just a model. Here you see the sylvian fissure on external. Um, and so here's the temporal lobe, occipital, parietal, and frontal. Um, and um, <coughs> here's the sylvian fissure. The relevance of the sylvian fissure, again, is that the auditory cortex um, and the receptive language cortices are up here on the lower bank of the sylvian fissure. The productive language cortex is up here on the upper bank of the sylvian fissure. I want to briefly mention this. I don't think this is in the version that I uploaded. I just added it today. Um, this is a recent study, I think from 2010. Uh, and what this is is a really fancy brain imaging technique called tractography. Essentially what they do is there's a kind of MRI where you can see white matter, and you can apply mathematical models to the white matter to convolve it into actual pathways, which essentially are the fibers of the brain. Uh, and what they did was they looked at the left and right hemispheres. And what I really want to draw your attention to is this picture in the middle on the top. Um, without going into too much gory detail, the colors have to do with the um, strength of the fibers. The blues and greens, the blues, greens, and purples are high uh, density fibers. So these are sort of highly efficient, focused fibers. The lighter, pinker colors are more diffuse fiber connections. And what I want you to draw your attention to in particular is you see lots of high strength, high connectivity bundles in the left hemisphere. You see a diffuser <coughs> pattern of activation and connection in the right hemisphere. If you look at the gross amount of anatomy of the left and right hemisphere in a person with left language, uh, they look pretty much the same, but with this more fine-grained anatomical view that this kind of uh, MRI allows for, you see there's actually a fairly profound difference between these language structures and the more holistic processing right hemisphere. Um, the parietal lobe, then, um, the parietal lobe is primarily responsible for sensory functions, specific somato sensation. And again, there's a sensor homunculus. And the body is mapped out over the course of the, uh, the primary sensory area and the parietal cortex. Parietal association areas are also important for a number of things. Uh, there's a wear stream that we'll talk about more later that has to do with spatial location. And what I mean by that is visual information uh, from the occipital lobe is passed to the parietal lobe for processing of where objects are. It's passed to the temporal lobe for what objects are. Um, and at some point in the book, we'll, it'll probably mention a concept of um, blind sight. And so there's some people who have a certain kinds of blindness where they're still, they have still some of their um, processing intact. And so for instance, they can have their wear stream intact. And so they may not be able to see, but they may be able to avoid objects. And it's their vision that's allowing them to avoid objects, even though they don't have a conscious perception of the objects. Um, the parietal cortex is, as I mentioned, also important for arithmetic and calculation at a basic level. Uh, there's actually an interesting uh, syndrome called Gershwin syndrome, and it has four symptoms that have to do with these skills. Uh, agraphia, or difficulty writing, um, acalculia, um, or a difficulty with the arithmetic, finger agnosia, meaning with your eyes closed, you can't tell which finger I'm touching. If I hold out my fingers, I'll hold out your fingers, make you close your eyes, and I touch this finger. They don't know which one is being touched. That's a spatial skill. Uh, and then left-right confusion, which is also a spatial skill. Uh, and this is seen in, uh, in parietal infarctions and parietal strokes. Finally, the occipital lobe. The primary function, as you probably know, is vision. Uh, and the occipital lobe has a huge amount of visual information processing. Um, and probably compared to the other lobes, in particular here, there's a ton of unimodal uh, processing skill because vision is a really complex skill. And so there's visual cortex right by the calcarine fissure that has a visual field in it that's organized in this backwards and upside down kind of pattern. But then there's also tons and tons of neurons in the visual cortex that are responsible for detecting features in the visual field. Um, shapes and relationships, um, spatial organization and things that can be used to tell where objects are and what objects are, uh, tools that can help the body render, the brain render uh, the 2D visual information into a 3D spatial representation and so forth. Um, important to know about the occipital lobe, I mentioned 
that the somatic cortex and the uh, motor cortex have this homunculus kind of organization. There's a photo or visual organization, phototopic kind of organization for the occipital lobe. Um, it's based on the visual field, not the eyes. Uh, meaning the left hemisphere handles right space, not the right eye. The right hemisphere handles left space, not the left eye. And so um, the optic nerves exit the eyes, and so your right optic nerve carries information from just your right eye. Uh, there's an optic chiasm that's near the limbic system, and they cross paths. And what happens at the optic chiasm is that the left hemisphere information, the left space information, so the left space information is going to be um, the outside side of your left eye and the inside side of your right eye that are looking over here. Those are merged and sent to the right hemisphere. And then the outside side of your right eye and the inside side of your left eye, which look over here, are merged and sent to your um, left hemisphere. That's what I mean by the spatial organization. Any questions about that? Um, Calgary and Fisher, this one. Um, the parietal so occipital sulcus also divides the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. This one is important because the calcary fissure is the sort of bed of the visual, uh, the primary visual cortex. We'll talk about that more when we talk about visual systems. Um, so we talked about the four hemispheres. Again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that a lot of the human cortex is devoted to um, association or multimodal cortex, meaning not primary sensory cortex, but cortices that coordinate multiple um, sensory and motor functions in order to uh, engage in complex behavior. That's actually a huge part of the cortex. Uh, and these higher order cortical processes are really crucial to higher order cognitive and behavioral skills seen in primates and in particular in humans. So here's that picture again, and you can see it really clearly here or here. You see that you've got primary motor cortex is just this, and maybe Broca's area. Primary somatosensory cortex is just this. And then the, so primary motor, primary sensory are here, here for audition, here for vision. That's it. All of this is association or higher order cortex. Look at the relative proportion of higher order cortex to sensory and motor cortex. It makes it clear that we get most of our work done by integrating across these domains. As we're talking about the cortex, I want to mention something briefly about memory that's important to start thinking about. When we start talking about memory more, there are localized structures that are strongly involved in the formation of memory. Uh, the limbic system, in particular, the hippocampus, the amygdala, uh, the cingulate gyrus, uh, and the structures in the thalamus and so forth that are in those circuits that we'll talk about more. Those structures are really important for the formation of memory. They are not involved in the storage of memory in the sense that memories are not stored in specific, like, they're not programmed in specific brain locations. Like you don't have a little nucleus in your cortex somewhere that remembers uh, your sister's birthday party, right? That's not the way that memories work. The way that memories work in terms of storage is that they work by reprogramming, excuse me, they work by reprogramming the motor and sensory traces that occurred during the activity being remembered. Um, meaning your memory, you can think of your memory as being organized into motor and sensory memories. You have a motor memory for what you do. Um, maybe this is relevant, for instance, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Sometimes um, I need to call someone, and if you ask me to tell you what their phone number is, I can't quite get it out. But if you give me a phone, I just dial it, and I've got the right number, right? Because I've got a motor memory of the number. Even if I don't have a sensory memory of the number as a series of digits, I have a motor memory that I can use to track this information. That motor memory is programmed in all the neural circuits that are required for my finger to do that dialing, right? And so the more that the situation looks like my finger doing that dialing, the more likely that motor, sense, the more motor trace is likely to be uh, reactivated to help me remember. If that situation has changed dramatically, that motor trace is not going to help me very much. Similarly, I remember those numbers based on sensory traces. If you tell me your phone number, then I've got an auditory trace. Persistence of that auditory trace and modification of the connections uh, that were associated during that auditory or sensory experience, that's how you remember. And it can be a conjunction of motor and sensory uh, 
traces as well. But you remember, not in a local fashion, but by these traces of the different motor and sensory neural circuits that were activated in the process that you're remembering. And they can be reorganized. Um, very young children and some people, uh, even when they're not so young, have eidetic memories or photographic memories. Those photographic memories are highly sensory. Uh, that's very normal at a young age. And the reason it's very normal at a young age is because you don't have an explanation for anything. You don't have a structural ability to remember. In principle, you could remember uh, this slide, uh, the way the computer would remember the slide if I take a print screen, right? And the way the computer remembers it if I take a print screen is they remember that there's a dark pixel here and a light pixel here, and over here there's some dark pixels, right? That's a very inefficient way to store this screen for the computer, as opposed to the way PowerPoint stores the screen, which is it knows it's got a white screen and, what, like 50 or 60 words here, right? So. The computer needs very little space to store the knowledge that these words in this font and size are on this white background. It needs a lot more space to store it in a pixel by pixel kind of fashion. That logic is also true for your brain. It's very hard to, it's relatively harder to store an eidetic memory of this if you're capable of understanding the words, although you can and you do. Your brain organizes, for instance, by remembering the words, and that organization allows it to condense the memory and it it can replace the sensory trace with the organized trace that is based on the interpretation of the information. And so you may make certain systematic errors, like maybe there's a, a grammar mistake that I made in this. Your non-identic memory is going to uh, mi often be more likely to misremember the grammatic error, because you'll automatically correct it, because it's easier to remember the gra grammatically correct sentence than the grammatically incorrect one. But We'll talk a lot more about memory, but I just, as a teaser, I wanted to mention this idea. Uh, memory is formed by programming motor and sensory traces, uh, that is, in all these association cortices and in these sensory and motor cortices, uh, rather than being localized like in the limbic system. Um, let me talk about the limbic system or the limbic lobe next. Some people do call the limbic system a lobe, so it's in principle the fifth lobe besides the frontal, occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes. Um, the, the limbic system is called that because these are medial edge structures. Uh, so if you take a picture of the middle of the brain or you cut the brain in half, you can get a very clear visualization of the limbic system. Um, it includes things like the amygdala and the hippocampus. Uh, it's extremely important in learning and memory, including the motivation and behavior. Um, you probably have heard of patient HM. Uh, he's a person with epilepsy in Canada. He died, I think, two miles of grad school, like maybe three years ago. Um, but he taught us a lot about memory because he had structures, uh, including the hippocampus and the amygdala, removed bilaterally, and he had a dense amnesia. He was unable to form new memories. Again, with this idea that the memories are not stored in the limbic system, he was able to remember old memories, but he wasn't able to form new ones. Um, and so the limbic system is crucial for the formation of new memories. Uh, it's this older reptilian or archae or paleocortical structure. The uh, hippocampus, for instance, has a three-layer cortex. It's strongly modulated and refined, but not made irrelevant by the mammalian structures. And one way to think about it is the limbic system is responsible for learning and memory, but more broadly, learning and memory are part of a motivated motivation system. That is, you engage in specific behaviors for a reason, and you deselect other behaviors for a reason. That's ultimately what learning is. Um, you might think of that in a cold cognitive way, like you learn that um, that uh, uh, you learn that you know, the first president was George Washington or something like that. You can also think of it in an emotional kind of sense. You learn uh, that if you mispronounce a certain word around your friends, they'll make fun of you. That's all learning also, right? But that learning then guides how you behave. Uh, and the, the general idea of learning is that you behave differently in the future, you may act in a different behavior in the future as a result of a prior experience. That's a very simple explanation of what learning and memory mean. So underlying all these complicated refinements of the cortical structures is this motivation system. Um, if you've ever watched Star Trek, there's um, the Vulcans, right, like uh, Spock. And the Vulcans are these aliens who develop this ability to essentially be um, a purely cortical creatures, they only think, they don't feel, right? That's kind of nonsense uh, in terms of the way the human brain is organized. 
because all of your behaviors are ultimately motivated behaviors. Otherwise, there would be no rationale to act or not act. Um, and even when you think of really highly cognitive pursuits like science, you have to decide what to study. And like someone has to decide they're interested in autism. That's a motivated behavior. Someone has to decide they want to cure cancer. That's a motivated behavior. The limbic system is really important in human behavior um, in terms of motivation. So the limbic structures, again, you can see them really clearly. Uh, in a midline view, um, uh, and there's the uh, the hippocampus, which curls around, is the amygdala forward of the hippocampus. Um, there's the mammillary body, which is at the end of the hippocampus, uh, and the fornix. Uh, there's the cingulate cortex, which may not be indicated here. Um, and uh, there are some other structures. We'll talk more about circuits in the limbic, limbic system. Um, the limbic system is very important in a circuit kind of sense. So the hippocampus doesn't store memories. The memories get stored as a result of a circuit that involves the hippocampus and the fornix, the mammillary bodies, the thalamus, the cingulate cortex, and part of the frontal lobe. We'll talk more about that. Um, let me mention while we're talking about the limbic system, the monoamine pathways briefly also. So um, this is a brutally complicated picture. Um, but you've heard of all these chemicals before, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Um, what this shows you is that there are some different pumps or sources of these chemicals. These chemicals are all centrally produced and distributed throughout the brain. Uh, for instance, uh, in green is dopamine. Uh, so the substantia nigra, for instance, is the dopaminergic. Uh, location that um, is impacted in Parkinson's disease. There are multiple dopamine systems, and that's part of the reason why uh, Parkinson's is a dopamine disease, but schizophrenia is also a dopamine disease. Um, and then, so here in red, uh, the, nor the, the serotonin uh, loci. In blue are the norepinephrine ones, and in yellow, acetylcholine. Uh, these are all important in different disorders. Serotonin and norepinephrine are particularly important in depression, anxiety, pain. Uh, acetylcholine is particularly important in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, dopamine is particularly important in Parkinson's and schizophrenia. We'll talk more about all of those. But these also have a strong interrelationship with the limbic system. And waving my hands a little bit, if, if you follow all these paths and arrows, I want you to notice that there are a ton of them that pass through the limbic region, the limbic circuits, limbic hardware is all in this area. You see how that's kind of, a lot is going on there with these chemicals. And, and actually, there are a lot of uh, processes that involve monoamines in the limbic system. The dopamine neurons, again, really briefly. The substantia nigra is called uh, the black substance because that's the way it looks. Um, and this is a cross-section of the brainstem uh, at the level of the red nucleus. And um, that's not so important for you to know, but I wanted to show you this just because this is the substantia nigra. It's dark. Um, the dark parts are essentially <clears throat> bodies that produce dopamine. Uh, here's a substantia nigra in green, dopamine producing. This depigmentation that you see in the Parkinson's disease brain, here it's not dark. That's a result of the cell death, the loss of these uh, dopamine-producing neurons, uh, and that loss of dopamine is, is, what, causes, is the, what causes the symptoms of Parkinson's, and that can be addressed to some extent by uh, adding dopamine back in the system. The basal ganglia, that we, we did some uh, identifying of them in the exercise earlier. Uh, the caudate, the putamen, the nucleus accumbens, which is, uh, in some sections, you can see the nucleus accumbens, uh, the caudate and putamen form a C-shape, uh, and the nucleus accumbens sits at the, um, at the joining of that C. Uh, and then the globus pallidus. Um, so well, alongside some associated structures that border the limbic system, these are called basal ganglia. The term ganglia is kind of strange. Normally ganglia is used in the peripheral nervous system, but that's what these structures are called. Uh, and they're basal because they're near the basal forebrain. Um, what they're really involved in is filtering and selecting information. And like the limbic system, they do that via these frontal subcortical circuits. And here are some pictures of these. Um, this is, in this particular case, what they're looking at is 
kind of complicated, but these circuits involve multiple basal ganglia structures along with the cortex. And so without getting into too many details, if you tame in the um, uh, substantia nigra, pars compacta, I think that is, the globus pallidus, the symphalinum nucleus, another part of the globus pallidus, the substantia nigra pars reticulata, which is another part of the substantia nigra, and VL is the nuclei. These are all interacting in a loop, and broadly speaking, the loop goes between the frontal cortex and these subcortical structures. The green arrows are excitatory and the red arrows are inhibitory. Um, and the reason that I'm mentioning this just briefly is uh, this model um, of these different relationships that excite or ultimately inhibit behavior. Um, and they do both in the sense that you might have an excitation of a cord, you know, this is excitatory, this is excitatory. But then here it's inhibitory, so the net result of this pathway is inhibitory, right? So there you have to kind of multiply the, the negatives together and so forth to understand this. But what you can do with that is then you can actually explain Parkinsonism, where you have, for instance, um, brainy kinesia or rigidity, you're not moving very quickly, and dyskinesia, where you're moving too much. Uh, and you can actually explain that by um, looking at um, these uh, different uh, relationships within uh, the, uh, these structures. And so, for instance, when you add the, the L-DOPA, um, it affects here, um, it has an inhibitory, inhibitory effect, which is then excitatory, and so it excites the cortex, for instance. Um, so it's actually a pretty good model of some of these different movement disorders, uh, as well as some other things like OCD uh, and uh, tics. Um, the thalamus. Uh, thalamus is actually a very complex structure. Uh, if you look at old psychology textbooks, they'll sometimes talk about the thalamus uh, like it's the um, like it's those old switchboard operators in the black and white movies. And really, what it does is it basically just takes information from here and routes it to there. It's doing a lot more than that. There's a lot of active processing of information that happens in the thalamus. Um, and there are a variety of structures within the thalamus that do different things. Uh, we'll talk more about those as we go. But for instance, there's the geniculate bodies that handle vision and audition. Um, there are uh, some structures that deal with things like pain and touch sensations. Uh, the anterior nucleus is involved in one of the limbic pathways with the hippocampus, and the median dorsal nucleus, or dorsal median nucleus, is involved in another um, uh, limbic pathway involving the amygdala. Uh, so there, it's involved in learning. Um, I want to briefly mention, so first of all, this is where it is in space. It's kind of sandwiched in between uh, the basal ganglia and behind the basal ganglia. Um, oh, sorry, here's the basal ganglia. Um, Here's the thalamus. Here's the hypothalamus to kind of give you an idea of where these things fall in space. Um, I want to mention in particular the pulvinar of the thalamus. Uh, this is the back of the thalamus. The medial and lateral geniculate bodies are at the back of the thalamus. Uh, the pulvinar is this large structure here. The pulvinar is relatively much more developed in humans compared to the rest of the thalamus. Um, meaning the pulvinar is proportionally larger than the rest of the thalamus uh, in humans compared to primates, other primates or other mammals. Um, the same thing is true for the prefrontal cortex. And the pulvinar handles some pretty high level cognitive skills uh, that, uh, that humans have in particular. And part of that has to do with feature binding. Um, the pulmonar seems to be responsible for helping uh, coordinate activity between different cortices to recognize that um, different sensory or motor features bind together into a meaningful conceptual unit. Uh, and so they, it allows us to do uh, information processing of our senses. Underneath the thalamus, hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus are the two hairy glands. Uh, are very important in terms of uh, certain autonomic behaviors. There's a kind of four Fs mnemonic for this, uh, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. Um, meaning these are, these are the kind of activities that the thalamus is involved in. And so for instance, for the hypothalamus, 
for instance, uh, people who have tumors in this area, like pituitary tumors, you might, some symptoms that you might notice, they're hypothalamic in nature, it might be bad temperature regulation, it might be irritability, it might be changes in eating behavior, um, it might be changes in reproductive behavior, like uh, disturbance of menstruation. Um, so you might see those kinds of things uh, when the hypothalamus is affected. Um, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus work very closely in terms of regulating autonomic behaviors uh, through uh, hormones. And we'll be talking much more about the neuroendocrine processes. Um, here's a picture of all of that. Um, and I want to just draw your attention to a little bit of co-location here. Um, here is a thalamus. This massa intermedia is that connection between the two lateral ventricles where the thalamus touch on either side. Um, here is the fornix and the mammillary bodies are down here somewhere. Um, so thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland. There's a little um, depression in the skull called the sala turcus turcica, turcica, or Turkish saddle. And that's the place where the uh, pituitary gland sits. Um, then the mammillary body is involved in the limbic system. The structures are all kind of co-located. The optic chiasm is here too. Uh, and so for instance, when you're doing clinical diagnosis based on neurological symptoms, there is like one common uh, brain tumor, it's a pituitary tumor, and it causes symptoms that are really beautifully explained by this co-location. Uh, because it affects the optic chiasm, it will cause tunnel vision, because this is where the paths of the visual systems cross. And so uh, the crossing fibers are, again, if you think about that, when you look to the right, it's the inside right eye and the outside, um, the inside left eye, right, outside right eye, right? That goes to the left hemisphere, so um, this left eye is staying on the left side, but the right outside view is going across. And similarly, the left outside view is going across. When those crossing fibers are impinged, you lose your exterior outside vision, so you get tunnel vision. Um, you get uh, memory problems because the limbic system is here, and you get uh, hypothalamic symptoms because the hypothalamus is here. And they all occur together, and it's a really strong clinical localization based on the symptoms. Um, here's a picture of the pituitary gland from the textbook. Um, and there's a process that we'll get into in more detail, this neurosecretory process where the hypothalamus, the neurons control the gland cells that release the chemicals. The glands in the pituitary, many of them are, are involved in then further downstream regulation of other hormones that uh, are produced elsewhere in the body, as well as direct regulation of structures elsewhere in the body. And so then when these get re released into the bloodstream, they can have widespread effect. Um, I'd like to talk quickly about the cerebellum. Um, here's an extra picture of the cerebellum. Um, cerebellum is a structure that integrates motor activity and some sensory information to achieve balance and coordination. And these are the most common things that you hear talked about from the cerebellum. But it actually has an analogous role in the regulation of cognition and emotions. And there's actually uh, there's a disorder called the uh, cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome that you can see in certain kinds of cerebellar tumors. And essentially you see, if I think about the, uh, the motor coordination is kind of like, in a very loose sense, you can do a lot of moves, right? If you stitch those moves together gracefully, they look like dancing. If you don't stitch them together gracefully, they're just moves, right? The cerebellum is in, involved in stitching them together and modifying them. For instance, if I just show you how to wave my arm, then that wave may have well-defined endpoints. If I'm lifting my arm up to wave to you, you see how now I'm changing that motion, right? Stitching together needs to involve smoothing out these different things. If you ever, um, if you've ever heard one of those automated voice systems on a telephone, where they record individual words and they stitch them together, they sound really funny, right? The words don't sound natural because you say the words differently in the context of a sentence. Again, your motor functions are being stitched together, so. You take the moves, you put them together, they look like dancing. That's kind of, in a loose sense, what happens with cognition and emotions with cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. Uh, your speech may be jerky because the coordination of the sounds across the words is not fluid, 
your emotional and cognitive responses may also be jerky, and that's in kind of sense. The cerebellum contains an extremely large number of cells. Some estimates suggest that there are 85 billion cells in the brain, and 70 billion of them are in the cerebellum. Um, the structures opposite to the neocortex, meaning the nuclei are on the inside and the white matter are on the outside. Uh, you'll sometimes hear that uh, organization referred to as a tree of life kind of organization or arbor of Eden. Um, and it also is an exception to the contralateral role for the cortex. In the cerebellar hemisphere's information is organized hypsilaterally. The fine anatomy has a three layer cortex, so again, it's an older kind of structure. Um, it has a granular cell layer that's packed with small granule cells, billions of them. Those are closest to the white matter. There's a Purkinje cell layer that has very, very large cells, and a molecular layer with unmyelinated axons and the dendrites of the Purkinje cells and inner neurons. Uh, and then on the interior, there are some uh, nuclei deep in the cerebellum. The peripheral nervous system, um, I want to talk really briefly about how the peripheral nervous system uh, may be more related to the central nervous system than we think. And autism is a good example. Uh, autism is generally considered a disease of neurodevelopment, of, uh, and more specifically of brain development. <coughs> but um, even though there are some genetic syndromes that cause changes in the brain for autism, but also cause non-brain changes, like uh, changes in the development of your fingers or skin issues or something like that. Um, generally speaking, autism doesn't affect non-brain health uh, in, a, in an overt kind of way. However, there's actually some evidence that um, in autism, one of the symptoms that can be prominent is self-injurious behavior. There's actually some evidence that the peripheral nervous system is abnormally developed in at least some of these people, that they actually have a different density of pain receptors in their skin. We just, in my mind, a really fascinating idea that autism may be a nervous system disorder that not only affects the brain, but also affects the periphery. And that may have a contributory role in explaining self-injurious behaviors because the pain reception may be not only altered in terms of how it's responded to in the brain, but the initial sensation from the skin may also be different. And here's a picture of that. Um, and in this picture, uh, a is uh, the control brain, and B is the person who has the self injurious behavior. And this is a little bit hard to read, but um, there are uh, some missing pain receptors in here. Um, and it's, it's a peripheral nervous system difference in the skin. The peripheral nervous system and the spinal cord and the ex and stuff outside the brain is important, even though we're going to focus on the brain a lot here. I want to talk briefly about the organization of the spinal cord. Um, the ventral and dorsal concepts remain important in the spinal cord. And again, the dorsal is the back surface. The ventral is the belly surface. Um, and the dorsal roots and the dorsal columns are sensory structures. The ventral roots and many of the ventral structures are motor functions. Um, and this is kind of consistent with the way the brain is organized with the motor functions in the front and the sensory functions in the back. Um, the dorsal roots have ganglia outside the spine, whereas the ventral roots synapse inside the central nervous system. Um, the spinal cord goes all the way down uh, to your seat, but the spine itself splinters <coughs> apart uh, in the lumbar region into the cauda equina. Um, and this is relevant to them. We talked about this lumbar puncture earlier. The reason you do a spinal extraction in the lumbar region is because the spine breaks up into these skeletons. If you do it over here, the needle will go into the spine. That's not good. You do it down here, the needle can avoid spinal tissue and you won't cause a nervous injury uh, as a result of doing the lumbar puncture. And that's, that's why it's done in the lumbar region where the spine breaks up into uh, the horse's tail, which is what cauda equina means. In cross-section, um, here again, dorsal columns that handle sensory information and dorsal roots that have a ganglion ventral motor pathway. Um, and here you see the dura mater around it. There's also some fat cushioning the spinal cord. Cushioning the spinal cord is really important. You don't want spinal injuries. Um, there are also a number, so there are many nerves that exit the spinal cord via these roots, all along the spine. There are also nerves that exit directly from the brainstem, and these are called cranial nerves. 
there are um, 13 of them, 12 depending on how you count. Um, each one has a unique function uh, or multiple functions. Many of them have sensory and motor functions, uh, like this one that handles taste and throat and larynx muscles. These are really important clinically because oftentimes you can really do a lot of localization in the brainstem by testing each of these nerves individually. Uh, and so cranial nerves are really important in clinical neurology. Um, and so fluctuations uh, of symptoms across cranial nerves <coughs> can be really helpful. Uh, a lot of things cross from contralateral to ipsilateral in the uh, brainstem. And so you get really unique signatures in the brainstem. Uh, we might talk about some examples of this, but you get signatures where some things happen on one side of your body and other things happen on another side of your body. And those kinds of signatures are almost always indicative of the brainstem. Uh, that pattern of cranial nerve deficits can also help isolate whether a problem is inside or outside of the brainstem. For instance, does the problem happen in the cranial nerve, or does it happen inside the brainstem, like with the nucleus that that cranial nerve attaches to? Uh, and can tell you where in the level of the brainstem are affected. Uh, a really simple example of this is when a person is in a coma, um, there's a flexor and extensor posture, posture um, and uh, the legs are always extended, but the arms are either uh, brought in or extended. Um, the the motor function, the motor pathway that handles that flexor response in the arms uh, uh, is at the level of the red nucleus, and so you can tell whether the brain is working above the red nucleus or not uh, based on that posture during the coma. Um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system; these are basically a conjunction of those cranial and spinal nerves. Um, there is a sympathetic system that handles activation. If you think about sympathy, you're getting activated emotionally, you're having the same feeling as someone else. Your sympathetic system coordinates that response. Your parasympathetic system quells that response. Um, so fight or flight, relaxation and restoration. Um, the sympathetic system is a thoracolumbar system, so it comes out of the thoracic and lumbar spinal cords. The, um, Parasympathetic system is a craniosacral system. So it comes out of the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves. Um, if you've ever heard of craniosacral therapy, it's a kind of massage therapy. I won't get into whether it actually works, but in principle, the idea is that it's affecting this craniosacral sacral parasympathetic system to uh, achieve relaxation. Um, a couple more minutes to get you out of here on time. Um, here's a picture of the sympathetic nervous system. And so here, um, you've got activation of the heart, the lungs, the liver, the the GI system, the kidney, uh, the urinary system. Um, and so, and then with the parasympathetic system, you've got innervation of the same things. And so you can raise your heart rate, you can lower your heart rate, you can make your breathing rapid and shallow, you can make your breathing slow, and these work reciprocally. And so deep breathing, for instance, is a really simple relaxation technique. When you take long, deep breaths, you slow your lungs down. Slowing your lungs down has a backwards effect through the parasympathetic system. It then causes a more diffuse relaxation of the system. It triggers more parasympathetic activity. Because these work um, in opposition to each other. You have parasympathetic activity or you have sympathetic activity, and there's a balance between them. You increase your parasympathetic activity in some areas, other areas will come along. Likewise, if you increase your sympathetic activity, other areas will come along as well. So for instance, when you deep breathe, you slow your lungs down, that feeds back and slows your heart down as well. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about the vascular supply to the nervous system, which I think is something the book talks about a little bit less. Um, the spinal cord is supplied by two vertebral arteries and an anterior artery. Uh, the vertebral arteries fuse together and enter the skull on the dorsal side. Uh, and then there are two internal carotid arteries that enter the skull on the ventral side. Uh, the major uh, blood distributions, uh, there's an anterior cerebral artery that comes off of the internal carotid arteries and it comes over the top of the brain like this. There's a middle cerebral artery that comes out like this in the periselvian region. So you think this one, periselvian, this, an MCA stroke on the left hemisphere is going to cause major language problems. And then there's a posterior supply that handles the cerebellum and the 
out of sync, the bottom of the temporal lobe that comes up from the back. The two blood supplies are connected. These are coming up the spine. These are your internal carotid arteries. There's a circle of Willis, which is a set of blood vessels that connect the two. So you see again, anterior cerebral arteries that go up the front, the middle cerebral arteries that go to the sides, the posterior cerebral arteries that wrap along the back. There are arteries for the cerebellum as well, uh, and for the, the brainstem. Um, here's a picture from a coronal section of what that looks like. There's a anterior supply, a middle cerebral artery supply, posterior supply, and then some of these internal structures are, are served in a slightly different way. Um, one important concept that's a corollary, this is the idea of a watershed area. Watershed areas are vascularized by small branches of two artery systems where they overlap. So, for instance, this one comes up this way, this one goes this way. There's going to be a watershed region in between the two. Um, and that watershed region is only vascularized by these small blood vessels. Uh, it's susceptible to small vessel disease, like the accumulation of uh, plaques in your, uh, in your blood vessels. Uh, and so without a frank stroke, you can have some compromise. There are certain cognitive symptoms that arise from uh, these, uh, these sub-acute uh, ischemic damage to the, these watershed vascular areas, especially for older adults who have vascular factors. All right.